Oh boy, I said I was going to do it, so now I guess I have to do it. Alright, let's get into this one. Now don't get me wrong, when sketching out the initial must-dos for this then-hypothetical series, The Matrix was right the hell near the top of the list. If I didn't think I needed to go through a decent number of efforts first, I might even have done it as the second or third episode. That's how relatively eager I am to cover it. So then, why am I just a tiny bit reticent as well? Well... You believe that you are special, that somehow the rules do not apply to you. Obviously, you are mistaken. Here's the thing, folks. The starting premise of Really That Good is that these are films whose stature as all-times classics with either most of the popular culture or a particularly broad base of devoted fans has gone so long unquestioned that they tend to be overlooked in terms of serious analysis, i.e. everyone knows this is good, why bother trying to convince anyone? And as far as the lack of analysis goes, that is just not true when it comes to The Matrix. In fact, I don't think it would be an exaggeration to say that The Matrix is probably the most over-analyzed, over-discussed, obsessively over-picked apart popular movie that wasn't an adaptation of something of the later 20th century outside of maybe Star Wars. And even then, even the most obsessed analysis of Star Wars tends to only get as far as vanishing into the fog of the series' own mythology, or hey, I just found out about this guy named Joseph Campbell. But The Matrix, on the other hand, let's face it, an entire generation of film school student writing was dedicated to mulling over this movie and, to a lesser extent, its sequels. Not because it felt like the first blockbuster-scale movie in forever that had something on its mind, though that was part of it, and demanded that you pay attention and think while watching it, but because all of the actual concrete ideas and concepts it does indeed offer exist alongside an embarrassment of riches and references to mythology, religion, history, spirituality, philosophy, and a billion other smarty pants shoutouts that made ideal subjects for clever kids to use with those newfangled late 90s toys called search engines. Suffice it to say, there probably hasn't been a single nameless background character in The Matrix that hasn't already been the subject of 20 to 30 student theses twice as long as the average episode of this series. But yeah, no pressure. As you can see, we've had our eye on you for some time. No. Oh, plus it's also probably the most influential action film from a technical standpoint of the last two decades. Seriously, generational dividing lines do not get clearer than this. The Matrix hit theaters in March of 1999, and overnight it felt like the entire action genre molted right out of its skin and an entirely new creature emerged. It was the moment when the niche genres and outside influences that had been nipping at mainstream action heels all throughout the 90s, anime, kung fu, video games, the club kid scene, mass market air quotes, anarchism, coalesced into singular force that overwhelmed the old guard. And not only did the revelation that CGI tricked out cameras, inventive editing, and Hong Kong wire work could turn one half of wild stallions into the new definition of an action god, effectively bring down the curtain on the beefcake era all at once, it set in motion the domino effect of outside-the-box action hero casting that arguably led to the revelation that painting a CGI robot suit onto a middle-aged reformed bad boy looking for his second chance was the secret formula for making all the money in the fucking world forever. Oh, and it's also a super problematic feature that in some ways encapsulates the directionless and damaging ennui afflicting Generation X, a political hot potato that still gets blamed for school shootings yet might also not get blamed enough for the self-absorbed political illiteracy of certain folks my age, but also a philosophical turning point for good or ill for likely millions of people worldwide to this day. And beyond even that, it feels like our understanding and appreciation of it is still evolving thanks to how inextricably the whole franchise is bound to its creators and viewed both through the prism of their unique body of work and truly fascinating lives as public figures. Oh, and hey, after I finish writing this goddamn thing, apparently now we're gonna get a prequel about Young Morpheus, which I don't really see how that fits since our eventual wrap-up of the whole damn franchise in part involved Morpheus realizing and accepting that most of the assumptions and misconceptions about his world that made him Morpheus in the first place were in fact misleading, but it also just kind of sounds like the logical place you'd go if you wanted to do a basic Neo storyline again, but still in continuity with the other movies, so I guess I've heard worse ideas. Plus, prospectively, it's a big opportunity at the lead of a major brand named Tentpole for some young up-and-coming black actor, so there's an upside to that. So yeah, amidst all of that, is The Matrix really that good? At last. Once again, a daunting thing about going back over The Matrix is that there has been so much 
goddamn writing already done about The Matrix, which means that an in-depth revisitation that's also doing more than just regurgitating other people's already made points is probably by design going to only touch on some of the finer points and probably skip right the hell over others. Suffice it to say, if you're likely to be disappointed that I don't spend 20 solid minutes on the various symbolic meanings possibly at play in naming Morpheus' ship the Nebuchadnezzar, you might want to start lowering your expectations right about now. For those of you still with us, well, the best place to start is at the beginning. But first... Unfortunately, no one can be told what the Matrix is. You have to see it for yourself. So, we'll come back to this subject in much greater detail later in the piece, but I feel like it's important to acknowledge something early and upfront. Here's the thing. Like a lot of other people in my business of film and cultural analysis, a lot of my background in the discourse over such things is grounded in both an academic and lay tradition which holds that with sufficient research and education, anyone should be able to weigh in with some authority on any subject, regardless of one's own background, because facts are objective and the academic ideal is a higher plane of knowledge where foundational and experiential information are beside the point. But the objective fact about that outlook, folks, is that it's bullshit. Background matters, experience matters, first-hand knowledge counts for a lot, and that means not everyone can become a genuine expert on everything or possess every insight. That's not how the world works. I can and have informed myself about a lot of things over the years, but that doesn't mean I can successfully offer every insight about every issue surrounding a film or the discussion thereof. Where that concerns The Matrix is that, as I imagine most folks are already aware, what was for a long time a fairly abstract discussion of the film and its various themes gained a much more concrete dimension when the Wachowskis, Lily and Lana, came out as transgender women. To be sure, The Matrix as a trans narrative was already one of the more prevalent interpretations of the material before either of them had revealed this, but ever since they did come out, this particular reading has, understandably, become much more prevalent and requires a particular focus, in my opinion. And though I've done substantial research into this and multiple other facets of the film, the conclusion I've come to is that it's a focus that I am just not going to be able to adequately provide. The fact of the matter is, I am a cisgender, heterosexual white man, and I simply do not have the perspective necessary to view The Matrix or any other film from a trans lens. I lack the life experience, the background, the necessary basic understanding of what it is to live that identity any more than I can adequately view it from a non-white racial lens, a queer lens, or any other marginalized outlook. And while I'm going to discuss the issues surrounding it vis-a-vis -vis the film and the filmmakers, I'm also not even going to pretend that what I have to say on the matter should be in some way definitive. To that end, I would encourage you to seek out further reading on this subject on your own. Some of the sources that were recommended to me by fans and followers that helped refine my own understanding have included Queering the Hets, Sex, Gender, and Sexuality in the Matrix and Existence by Hannah Ovnacht, Call Trans Opt, Transgender Themes in the Matrix by Chelsea L. Shepard, Fluid Realities, Fluid Identities, Gender in the Matrix by Hannah Coleman, Reading the Matrix, Queer Themes and Sensibilities in the Matrix Trilogy by Chris Mayer, Trilogy as Critical Theory of Alienation, Communicating a Message of Radical Transformation by Harry F. Doms. Decoding the Transgender Matrix, The Matrix is a Transgender Coming Out Story by Marcy Cook, and Rantasmo's video, Needs More Straight 7, The Matrix is Transgender Themes. I also owe a very particular debt of gratitude to Dr. Ellie Lockhart, also known as Bootleg Girl on Twitter, who generously corresponded with me in order to help refine my own understanding of the matter, and who has also written extensively on The Matrix and Transgender Themes herself in several pieces readily available online. As I said, I am going to do my best, and I'm grateful to everyone who reached out to help my best be hopefully that much better. But regardless, I felt it was important to acknowledge right at the start of this, before we go any further, that when it comes to exploring some themes in the context of Really That Good, neither myself nor the series should be regarded as any kind of final or even sufficient authority on the matter, and I would encourage you to broaden the scope of critical voices you regularly consume beyond me, and quite frankly, beyond cishet white male voices, period. So, in any case, The Matrix. Mikey, I think he likes it. How about some more? Hell yes. It doesn't get more basic than this, gang. The Matrix kicks ass. In fact, The Matrix kicks so much ass so definitively, I feel like the popular culture is still numb in the ass a little bit. It's actually hard to recall in this process just how different and refreshing and new everything about The Matrix felt in 1999 because immediately felt like every other notable action film that came out was either copying it wholesale or trying to measure up. Yeah, we'd seen bullet time in those Gap commercials. Hong Kong wire foo and heroic bloodshed John Woo gunfights had already made modest inroads and the first Blade did a lot of the same aesthetic gimmicks first, but the cocktail had never been mixed exactly like this. At a moment when both the action and sci-fi genres were both becoming spectacularly stale and the omnipresent encroachment of the new millennium had primed everyone for radical evolutions of damn near everything, The Matrix showed up almost out of nowhere and declared, here is something completely different.
It had blockbuster energy, but an indie movie soul, pulling the kind of aesthetic cinematography tricks and explicit thematic sub-reference that you were more likely to get from Sundance back then. It was an action film that wanted its audience to pay attention to the dialogue and think deep thoughts about philosophy and existentialism. It broke the laws of physics to deliver action beyond what was physically plausible and justified it with elaborate metaphors conflating cyberspace, transhumanism, and transcendentalism. It remixed then-overlooked multimedia from video games to comics to anime into a new exciting way of doing action scenes we didn't know we'd wanted until we saw it done. And the characters. Here was a wise mentor stationed at the crossroads of wizard, sensei, general, and, uh, pharmaceutical hookup. Here was an actor who'd been taught to fight rather than a fighter trying his best to act. Here were villains whose dry, generic authority figure affect was both expertly executed asset and the whole bloody point of their conception. Here was a wily traitor whose predicament was oddly sympathetic under the circumstances. And Trinity, well... And yeah, it can't be denied that the overall premise spoke to people. We'll get into the mountain of ways in which The Matrix's view of itself as a metaphor for modern real life is beyond problematic in many, 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 so many respects. But in the context of the moment in which The Matrix emerged, there's just no getting around how much the notion of a detached office drone vanishing into cyberspace culture, discovering the secrets of the system, and becoming a master of his own destiny spoke to the cultural anxieties of the age, specifically more so if you were a bored, middle-class white dude whose apathy towards late 20th century relative stability had metastasized into paranoia. Yes, but still, the film owned the psyche of its moment the way Easy Rider had owned the stagnation of the counterculture, or Star Wars had owned the rise of retro-futurist nostalgia. The Matrix clicked, it spoke to people, regardless of whether or not you think it had anything to say. It really can't be overstated just how much of a break The Matrix was from the preceding two decades of Western action filmmaking when it came out, or how difficult that can be to remember from this vantage point, or even conceive if you weren't allowed to watch it happen firsthand. To be certain, I have a deep and abiding love for the era that gave us Schwarzenegger, Stallone, Van Damme, and the brawny, bare-bones narrative that came with them. You can joke all you want about the beefcake era, but it grew out of a sincere place and had genuine generational appeal. If it hadn't, it wouldn't have lasted as long as it did. But all trends have a shelf life, or at least they did before the internet shortened cultural regeneration cycle to a matter of weeks and days, and by the late 90s, the genre was getting very, very stale. Arnold's star power was starting to wane, Van Damme peaked and slid fast, Stallone was trying to slip back into drama, Dolph Lundgren was very well in a direct-to-video territory by then, and Chuck Norris, eh, well, okay, bad example, Chuck was never any good. The cultural psyche and broadly held anxieties and ambitions had shifted away from the conditions that birthed that cycle, and niche influences like anime, gaming, and the Hong Kong action cinema were gaining ground while not fully breaking mainstream. And then suddenly out of nowhere comes The Matrix, looking to top to bottom like nothing ever had before. Where action films before had been strained to be gritty and sweaty, The Matrix was slick and cool. Where earlier action heroes had largely been framed as cops, soldiers, or regular Joes pushed too far, the heroes of The Matrix were the angry agitators, literally running around making a mess and blowing shit up while getting into slugfest with cops and soldiers, and not the kind that turned out to be misunderstanding. Back up! Stand back up! I mean, let's not beat around the bush. If a crew like Morpheus Gang had swaggered onto the scene in any action film made in the 20 years leading up to The Matrix, you would immediately know they were the bad guys. And not just because a bunch of them were people of color. They were edgy, exotic looking, they dressed like European fashion models, and instead of winning by good old fashioned muscle and grit, they were gonna whoop your ass with fancy schmancy Eastern martial arts. I know Kung Fu. Show me. And that's before it turns out that the only reason they can do a lot of what they do isn't because they hit the weight room, took their vitamins, and said their prayers, but because they'd undertaken a sci-fi cyberspace version of meditating themselves into a higher plane of understanding. I mean, think about that for a second. Part of the working premise of this movie is that having a more open mind and comprehending facets of reality beyond average people makes you literally superhuman. Now that speaks to as many dark impulses as it does sincere ones, and we'll talk about that later, but yeah, that was a premise a whole generation had been waiting to fall in love with for years before they'd heard it. And it was smart. Again, maybe not even as close to smart as a lot of people considered, or as it considers itself, but smart all the same. And compared to where action films were before, it's not even a question. Sure, today it's common to see even dumb action films take a stab at talking philosophy or socio-political business, but in 1999, having characters sit down and talk up existentialist concepts while laying out the backstory for a kung fu gunfight explosion fest, that was unheard of. And those extra layers of depth were what helped give The Matrix its extra layers of appeal. I know exactly what you mean. So let's talk about appeal. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there. 
like a splinter in your mind, driving you mad. It is this feeling that has brought you to me. Do you know what I'm talking about? Why, yes, Morpheus, I have. And so has damn near every other person who is watching, has watched, or will watch this movie. You know why? Because what you just described is called being 14 years old. You can see it when you look out your window or when you turn on your television. You can feel it when you go to work, when you go to church, when you pay your taxes. It is the world that has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. I'm the only person who gets what's really going on, everything is aligned against me, all the stuff that's unfair or doesn't make sense is evidence of that alignment. If you truly want to understand the appeal and power of the Matrix, what first must be understood is that in mindset, aesthetic, and execution, it is a fundamentally adolescent film. That's not an insult or even a criticism, it's an observation of fact. We have a rule. We never free a mind once it's reached a certain age. It's dangerous. The mind has trouble letting go. But what does that mean? What does the idea that the Matrix come from and appeals to a basic mindset of an angry teenager mean for its cultural presence? Well, think about what the status of a teenager refers to in Western cultural paradigm that gave rise to both it and the Matrix. A teenager is a child who is old enough to understand the workings of the adult world, but still cut off from having any tangible influence or control in it. Key word there? child. Childhood is one of the very few generally universal experiences a vast majority of the human race can be said to share. Not the conditions of childhood, holy shit, no, but the broad conceptual sense. I'm not talking about teddy bears and lullabies and Saturday morning TV and feelings good or ill about your parents. I'm talking about the gut level, lizard brain, sub-sub, subconscious sense of being small and to varying degrees helpless at the mercy of a big world operating on interlocking systems you can't begin to wrap your mind around, controlled by beings who are like you but larger, more powerful, and never seem to be telling you the whole truth. And if childhood is that condition, teenagehood is being aware of that condition, but still powerless to do anything about it, but brace wildly against your restraints. This is insane. What's this happening to me? What I do? we all been there, and that's part of why Neo's journey of enlightenment resonates even if you yourself don't directly identify with the more explicit reference point of being a bored white guy who fantasizes about slipping into another reality as a quasi-orientalized cyberpunk club kid vigilante. However, universal experience aside, there are also some very specific in-the-moment cultural touchstones that made the Matrix so profoundly well-connected to the cultural zeitgeist, and here I'm talking about a much deeper cultural connection than the club fashions and the anime, video game, and music references. For just one example, Neo being effectively told, hey kid, the world actually isn't as safe and pleasant to the point of boring as you perceive it to be. It's actually really harsh and terrible, there's a huge system in place that literally chews people up to sustain itself, and the whole thing relies on you being too pacified to notice, is pretty much a macro version of the way a lot of mainstream Gen X youth arrived at their adult, or at least college age, social and political awakening. <clears throat> Very exciting time. Oh, and note that said wake up speech is delivered by a black leader of a racially and gender diverse team to a character who, while Keanu Reeves is in fact of mixed race in real life, is very much coded white in the film. Fancy that. I didn't say it would be easy, Neo. I just said it would be the truth. Stop. Let me out. Let me out. I want out. <laughs> Now, you might be inclined to view this particular aspect of the Enlightenment metaphor as little more than shallow, and it is, and we'll talk about that, but also remember, the Matrix mindset is deliberately adolescent. The mechanism doesn't work otherwise. So yes, Thomas Anderson's awakening into Neo and ascendance to stature of the One is on one level pretty much the most extreme fantasy extrapolation possible of every guy, or gal, but yeah, mostly guys, who adopted a whole identity and outlook after getting their mind blown by their first cool professor, i.e. not only did your freshly woke ass immediately get invited to join the revolution, but it turns out you were the best, most special snowflake the revolution had been waiting for all along. How about that? Here. Take a cookie. But that's not a bug. It's a feature. Let's talk about wish fulfillment. Most movies, and certainly most popular movies, involved some degree of wish fulfillment fantasy. Sometimes you get it just by watching the movie, i.e. I wish I could see a dinosaur. Sometimes you get it vicariously through the characters and story, i.e. I wish I could find true love. Sometimes it's a very simple fantasy like I'd like to visit Rome. I'd like to be crazy rich. I'd like to see that one lady from Baywatch topless. Or were you looking at the woman in the red dress? I was... Look again. To deny our own impulses is to deny the very thing 
that makes us human. Other times, it's a more complex fantasy, like I'd like to travel to the most exotic places on Earth with no concern for financial, political, or national limitations, joyfully inflict violence on my enemies using cool futuristic gadgets, and have as much consequence-free sex as I want with whomever I want, and not only suffer no ill consequences, but be heralded the patriotic hero of my nation for doing so. But you know what the most common wish fulfilled by popular fiction is? The one that damn near everyone in the history of humankind has always wanted to hear, and that the vast, vast, vast plurality of stories and myths and legends, especially those with a moral component, place at their center. It's the seven simple words. You are already doing the right thing. The Oracle. She told me She I'm... told you exactly what you needed to hear. That's all. Right? Isn't that just the most reassuring thing on Earth you could hear? You're on the right track. You've got it figured out. Maybe you need to do it a little better or recommit to it and you stop doing it and you shouldn't have. Bottom line, you had the right idea. Hey, Bell, you know what's going to fix the beast? You doing that exact bookish yet headstrong hot nerd thing you've been doing all along. Hey, hobbits, you know how you're basically inclined to be satisfied with a version of comfortable English middle class life and don't feel the same ache for wealth, power, and glory that the other species of Middle Earth do? Guess what? That makes you the only beings who can even attempt to carry around the one ring without immediately getting into its temptation. Hey, Mr. Anderson, do you feel a vague sense of the world being all messed up, leading you to lash out at forces aligned against you? Well, do we have some interesting news for you. Wow. He is the one. But as much as the audience likes seeing characters they like and identify with receive that kind of validation, if you want a movie that'll attach itself to the cultural psyche of a generation, you've got to tell a story that validates them. A story that tells them, either directly or in the abstract, that some key positive component of their own life and or personality makes them heroic, special, or even just badass. And that's harder than it looks, because people can sense and reject when they're being pandered to. Wiggity, wiggity, wait up. Back on, party. When are they going to get to the fireworks factory? <laughs> Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy? It was a disaster. You know what movie does it perfectly? Star Wars, the original. Think about it. Despite the sci-fi long time ago setting, Luke Skywalker is very much framed as a contemporary young man of his time, i.e. a college-age baby boomer. Uneasy, self-righteous, rattled by wanderlust, and consumed by daddy issues. What was the prevailing philosophical and pop spiritual outlook for such a person in 1977? Chilling. Be chill. Chill out, right? Yeah, and that's very much how the Force works in that first movie. All the transcendental quasi-Buddhist business comes up in the second one when Yoda gets more specific. In the original, it's mainly all about going with the flow. Yes, Luke, let go of your surroundings, feel the force all around you, relax, go with it, sit Indian style, maybe put on some Floyd, light some incense. So when Luke blows up the Death Star by using the Force, he has effectively saved the galaxy by being a really, really chill dude. You see that 1977 target audience very much resembling Luke Skywalker in background and temperament? You were already doing the right thing. Oh, what's really going to bake your noodle later on is... Would you still have broken it if I hadn't said anything? And The Matrix is working exactly that same wish fulfillment fantasy, but with a cyberspace twist for a Generation X and early millennial target audience. Yes, the franchise does offer interesting things with its conception of technology in the margins. The notion of simulated layers of virtual reality as a Clark's Third Law literalization of reaching for higher planes of enlightenment to unlock new wisdom or skills is clever to the point of genius, but in more base respects, The Matrix effectively creates a scenario where being internet cool makes you cool cool, both in the more high-minded sense, i.e. the projective self-image conceit, but more directly, well... Okay, this is already starting to run long, but the context is necessary. 1996 to 1997 is generally thought of as the year of the internet in the American and Western European popular culture, from whence the Matrix initially emerged. Yes, the web and regular web use existed before that, but that was the moment where it rapidly started to become standard and eventually expected for middle to upper class families to have internet access in their homes and for school kids to be using some form of the internet as part of their education. And for a few solid years there, the internet early adoption was very much a cultural phenomenon where grasp of the new speed at which information could be accessed and attained became became a potent form of performative rebellion for many internet-savvy young people. The time has come to make a choice, Mr. Anderson. 
Now, I get that this can be difficult to conceive for many viewers even a few years younger than me, but once upon a time, not that long ago, the notion of being able to instantly pull up all the information on any obscure, random, trivial topic via the internet honestly felt like a goddamn magic trick, especially when you were a teenager doing it in the vicinity of adults. No, understanding how to effectively run a topic search on Webcrawler, ask your parents, didn't actually make you a walking expert on all human knowledge. But having someone ask who was in that movie and being able to tap a few keys and answer them with the entire cast list for a few years, that was the I am briefly a god among insects endorphin rush for a whole generation. And The Matrix effectively takes that feeling and says, yeah, seeming like you know everything without having to do the memorization and educational legwork feels nice, but wouldn't it feel even better if kung fu, gunfighting, and helicopter piloting skills worked the same way? Can you fly that thing? Not yet. Tank, I need a pilot program for a B-212 helicopter. No. Of course it would. To generation internet, you'd best believe that was some serious catnip. And that's before you couple it with the enlightenment narrative, i.e. I know how the world really works, so now I'm literally invincible. But for all of the adolescent simplicity in the Matrix premise, once you strip away all the sound and fury, there's also quite a bit of truth. It's not groundbreaking truth, these are all fairly old and time-tested spiritual and philosophical ideas after all. But presenting them not only in the context of an action film, but as the mechanics of how the science fiction superpowers of the characters work is a brilliant way to visualize what are, even in simplified terms, some fairly esoteric stuff. Case in point, the key to Neo unlocking the true potential of his abilities turns out to be wrapping his head around this. Do not try and bend the spoon. That's impossible. Instead, only try to realize the truth. What truth? There is no spoon. There is no spoon? And that sounds pretty simple in practice, right? Once he fully accepts on a fundamental level that no matter how real the world of the Matrix feels, it's not real and can thus be ignored and even overwritten on his whim, he's free and becomes unstoppable. But the whole point of the film is that it's really, really difficult to truly achieve this state because it's not just the world trying to convince you that it's real, but your body, your mind, your instincts, feelings, emotions, desires, loves, hates, that's why not everyone can do it. Hell, even Agent Smith can't totally ignore the Matrix, remember? I hate this place, this zoo, this prison, this reality, whatever you want to call it, I can't stand it any longer. It's the smell, if there is such a thing. But while the idea of how the mechanics of the Matrix are supposed to work isn't really fundamentally much deeper than the users are gods, programs are a feudal society of medieval adherence business from Tron, attaching it to ideas of perception and self-identity end up rendering the film's central narrative a surprisingly effective literalization of some decidedly difficult core concepts of philosophical and spiritual branches like classical Buddhism and transcendental meditation, i.e. the physical world being an impermanent state where we sever ourselves from in order to seek enlightenment, with Morpheus and his crew escaping from the Matrix but then willingly re-entering in order to lead others to enlightenment as an inversion of the ideal of the Bodhisattva. And while the Wachowskis were not the first to draw this particular parallel, they did it better and more approachably than anyone else. But again, if forced virtual reality equals the physical world holding us back from enlightenment was the only way to interpret the themes of identity and transcendence that drive the Matrix, I sincerely don't believe it would be as enduring as it is now or have made the impact it did on release. The broad strokes of Neo's journey, i.e. feeling a disconnect from one's own reality, discovering hints of something bigger in the untamed wilderness of the early internet, being nervous yet excitedly drawn into an underground subculture that may hold the answers you're looking for, discovering a mentor, learning a new yet strangely familiar outlook on the world, and adopting a new identity that feels more real than your previous one can apply to a lot of different life experiences that a diverse cross-section of moviegoers could relate to. Whether it's discovering new music, art, or fashion subculture, exploring a new religious identity, learning a new political philosophy, joining an activist cause, discovering a fandom, or even questioning and exploring one's own sexuality. I just thought, um, you were a guy. Most guys do. And as you might imagine, that's a big one. It's no accident that the rapid, though by no means rapid enough, acceleration of various LGBTQ rights movements among Generation X and Millennial Youth happened in tandem with the mainstreaming of internet and cyber subcultures, as the global reach and optional anonymity of digital communications allowed a generation of gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, queer youth to connect with peers and seek out and share information to a degree unimaginable in safety even a few years before. Again, absolutely not an overnight fix for a struggle that still very much continues, but suddenly both youngsters and plenty of adults 
adults who'd always felt different in some way, but had no means of support or safe access to information in their own immediate surroundings, could find and form support networks in the digital realm. And the repercussions of that change on 21st century LGBTQ and broader social justice movements has been so profound, it's probably still too early to get a full sense of how transformative it's been. But for the purpose of our current discussion, The Matrix so closely parallels that experience in the metaphorical sense of Keanu's main hero journey that the film emerged as something once unheard of in popular culture, a mainstream Hollywood action movie whose underlying themes spoke profoundly to a generation of LGBTQ youth. And that was a full decade before we were all made aware of just how personal that narrative may in fact have been to the creators of The Matrix itself, a revelation that for many has redefined how the film is to be viewed, but for others had seemed to confirm a subtext that they felt was there all along. My name is Neo. When The Matrix originally hit, the Wachowskis were basically unknown outside of the film industry and to indie movie fans who'd enjoyed their entertaining lesbian crime drama Bound from a few years earlier. And even once the film was out, they remained pretty private, secretive people. Oh, they were seemingly all too happy to talk about the production of the film, from innovative camera techniques to the various philosophical and mythological influences that informed their storytelling, but compared to other iconoclastic filmmakers who broke big in the late 90s like Tarantino, Kevin Smith, Spike Jones, etc., the Wachowskis showed very little interest in the Hollywood social scene. They weren't necessarily reclusive, but when they weren't developing film projects, you just didn't hear from them. And if if there was one thing you especially never heard from them, it was anything definitive about how we were supposed to interpret the overall meaning of the Matrix beyond the broadest and most malleable outlines possible. It was always clear that we were dealing with an extremely personal film coming from a very specific shared vision, but any specific real-life parallels were anybody's guess. And while plenty of rumors and innuendo surrounded the Wachowskis in the wake of the Matrix trilogy's massive success and the endless appetite for gossip and hearsay of the entertainment press, there was never anything concrete to hang a sign on, for lack of a better phrase. Then, shortly after the release of Speed Racer, Lana Wachowski officially came out as Lana Wachowski a transgender woman who was now living openly as such. There wasn't really a media event surrounding it at the time, it mostly just became another thing that two filmmakers who spoke very sporadically about their own lives spoke very sporadically about, and gradually filtered out through the rest of the entertainment press in due course, with public statements to various groups and more in-depth interviews coming much, much later. But for some film fans, well, suddenly, a culture that had never really stopped talking about The Matrix had what felt like some new vital information to plug into the understanding machine, a sensibility that only seemed clearer when Lily Wachowski came out in similar fashion in 2016. Was this the missing component to fully wrap in our heads around a film that had managed to remain obtuse and enigmatic even while making one of the biggest pop culture impacts of all time? Well, as I said at the start of this piece, I'm not really the person who's reading on the matter you should be giving anything close to prime credence to, but for purposes of this piece, the circumstantial data is extremely striking. Keanu's character, originally known as Thomas Anderson, is a person deeply unsatisfied on a profound existential level with his seemingly stable and ordinary life, who has found escapism in a secretive online community where he has adopted the more comforting identity of Neo, which is in turn led him to an underground group of people who are clearly keeping a secret of their own, but also seem to understand him, and more importantly, understand the feelings of unease and identity that he's wrestling with almost better than he does. At the same time, he also finds himself harassed and brutalized by sinister figures embodying classical images of traditional masculine patriarchal authority who are very, very interested in him keeping up his end of the status quo. Eventually, through further interactions and conversations with his mysterious new friends, Thomas Anderson has the truth of the world and his own identity revealed to him, emerging into a new world where his eyes are open to both the dangers he faces, but also the truth of his own self-identity as Neo. As part of this journey, he undergoes a spiritual, psychological, and physical transition wherein accepting himself as Neo is the key to unlocking a state of mind wherein his future is finally his own to shape and engages in a final conflict with a recurring nemesis who either wants to eliminate him or force him back into his earlier comforting unreality and who repeatedly taunts Neo by calling him by his rejected previous name. Mr. Anderson. Suffice it to say, yes, it is not difficult at all to read The Matrix as a symbolic trans narrative. And that's just some fairly surface level, oh hey, now that you mention it business. There's also more substantial and specific pieces of Matrix trivia that tie back to this theme, most notably the supporting character of Switch, aka the blonde one in white who says not like this right before Cypher kills her during the all is lost moment. The all is lost moment! If you're a Matrix fan, you probably know that Switch was played by Australian actress Belinda McClory. What you may not know as readily is that McClory was originally only supposed to be playing the role when Switch was in her Matrix form. In the script, when Switch was in the real world on the Nebuchadnezzar, the role would be played by a male actor, with the plan for the film being that both he and McClory would sport similar androgynous looks to extenuate the idea that Switch's projected self-image in the Matrix involved a literal change in gender, though it's not entirely clear to what degree this would have been acknowledged by the other characters. Warner Brothers apparently decided that this was something they could just not tolerate being in the final film. Not like this. Not like this. 
Also of note, both Lana and Lily have described themselves as having been aware of their identities as trans women since they were fairly young. But in a 2012 speech to the Human Rights Campaign, Lana went into much greater detail for the first time publicly, detailing her struggles with a fear of rejection by society, friends, loved ones, etc. should she let her truth be known, that she planned and almost followed through with a suicide attempt on a subway track. In The Matrix, a subway track is where this scene takes place. You hear that, Pastor Anderson? That is the sound of inevitability. So that's probably not a coincidence. So then, The Matrix is a transgender narrative? Yes, that absolutely fits. In fact, it fits a lot better than most of the other spiritual, philosophical, or experiential narratives that have been foisted on it over the years. And while it is, in fact, inappropriate for anyone but the filmmakers, especially in regards to this situation, to say, yes, this is a personal expression relating to this aspect of our lives, and here's exactly how, I'd say it's more than fair to rank this fairly high in the list of things that The Matrix is probably more specifically about than others. However, it's also true that the film is very deliberate about not tying itself directly lead to one interpretation. That's a big part of its success and a major contributor to its enduring quality. But is it also part of what's made it, for lack of a less instantly dated phraseology, one of the all-time problematic faves? This is usually the section that's kind of shorter, since this is a show about positivity and generally covers movies that are really good. However, The Matrix is no ordinary film, and its issues are no ordinary issues. For example, here's how the basic, let's call it, moral architecture of The Matrix core narrative foundations might sound if you left out all the specific plot details. <clears throat> Dude, do you hate your boring job and normal life? Do you feel like you're a special, awesome person, obviously better than most people, but held back deliberately from your true potential by a world that forces conformity and normalness on everybody? Well, guess what? You're totally right. There's a system, man, and it's keeping us all down just to fuel the machine, man. And the only people who can tell are the cool, turned-on, enlightened people like you and like us. We've got to fight the power and free everybody's minds, man. And the only way to do that is to blow it all up with guns and bombs and fashion late 90s anarchy, yeah! And it's totally okay for us to do it, man, cause woke up enlightened dudes like us are the only people who actually count, cause we're real, man. Everyone else is still following the system. You look around, what do you see? Businessmen, teachers, lawyers, carpenters, the very minds of the people we are trying to save. But until we do, these people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. They don't even count as people. In fact, they're so much a part of the system that they can turn out to be the bad guys at any time. So don't even worry about collateral damage or people's property or even accidentally killing anybody, man. Unload those bullets and burn all this shit down because it's the system, man, and you gotta fight the power. Yeah! Yeah. Like we've by now discussed ad nauseum, The Matrix not only makes the best narrative sense to a fundamentally adolescent sensibility, and while that's not a negative criticism in and of itself, an aspect that can't be ignored by anyone who has themselves successfully evolved into an adult mindset, whatever that actually means in 2017, is that a lot of the things that the teenage mind accepts as absolute righteous truth is often stupid and even downright horrifying when considered in hindsight. You can't have one without the other. The same narrow earnestness that bends the adolescent mind so easily toward romantic and heroic idealism also bends it toward the kind of self-centered power trip onanism that makes an ideology like random acts of violent anarchy will improve the world by shaking the sheeple out of their complacency. To be clear, I don't mean to suggest that the Wachowskis were somehow fundamentally immature when they wrote The Matrix, or that they intentionally meant to endorse the kind of self-justifying fire starter mentality that Neo and company's ideology inevitably boils down to in the real world. More likely, it seems to me they were more concerned with what these plot mechanics allowed them to do in terms of visuals and the bigger philosophical ideas it gave them free reign to visualize that they simply didn't put as much thought into more seemingly small-scale questions like, what does this sound like when you think about it for longer than it typically takes Neo, Morpheus, and Trinity to get to their next fight scene? If you are not one of us, you are one of them. What are they? Sentient programs. They can move in and out of any software still hardwired to their system. That means that anyone we haven't unplugged is potentially an agent. 
And hey, look, a lot of great stories break down outside of their own specific context, i.e. when reality, hindsight, or both come creeping in. Indiana Jones is a colonialist grave robber. Lord of the Rings subscribes wholeheartedly to divine blood right of kingship and the nobility. So do the Lion King and Star Wars, kind of. The hero of Close Encounters of the Third Kind is a family abandoning asshole. Batman, yeah, we'd be here all day. But the reasons those properties continue to stand firm once you start asking those questions is that there are other emotional and moral dimensions to the narrative that afford a more robust context. That's sort of what's meant by the question of whether or not a work holds up. Once whatever visceral aspect of the movie got you initially all charged up has either receded or come to be seen as not all that charge up worthy, is there more to keep you attached? To use a very extreme example from the same era that fits very much into the Matrix moment in this regard, I won't even front. When I was a stupid, angry idiot in high school and I first saw Fight Club, I thought Tyler Durden's stupid proto men's rights activism philosophy made a lot of sense. Man, I see in Fight Club the strongest and smartest men who've ever lived. I see all this potential, and I see it squandered. We're a generation of men raised by women. I'm wondering if another woman is really the answer we need. We're the middle children of history, man. No purpose or place. We have no great war. No great depression. Yeah, I knew he was a bad guy, but I took it in that Magneto context, where the bad guy is right but too extreme in their methods. Now, watching Fight Club as a no longer stupid grown-up, it is stunningly obvious that Tyler is essentially a skinhead, that Project Mayhem is a neo-fascist terrorist group, and that the film, while displaying an understanding of how such movements can be appealing, necessary, when making a cautionary tale, is nonetheless overwhelmingly, obviously, a scathing indictment of that mindset, in as much as the entire point of its big central revelation is that every supposedly charismatic man of the disenfranchised working male firebrand is secretly a pathetic, impotent man-baby. I'm a 30-year-old boy. The Matrix just does not have that extra level of introspective cushioning. It presents belief in its white hat, black hat binary between good trendster anarchists and evil men in suits as surely as Red Dawn believes in the Second Amendment. But a big part of what makes The Matrix special, as we've discussed, is that while its setup feels specific on the surface, it's malleable enough so as to speak to many, many different people and ideas on what feels like a very personal level. But that's also part of the problem. <sighs> why, oh why didn't I take the blue pill? Case in point, by now I imagine everyone knows about the so-called red pill movement among sad internet dweeblings and has had the appropriate laugh at the expense of right-wing men's rights activists naming their idiotic movement after a scene where a black man tells a clueless white guy that he literally needs to get woke about the world from a movie conceived, written, and directed by two transgender women. Jesus. What a mind job. And yes, that's very sad and funny as these things often are, but unlike the Fight Club example, there really isn't anything in the text of the film directly contradicting this particular interpretation, as we just got done discussing. You can see pretty clearly how they got there and why the persecution narrative of The Matrix appeals just as powerfully to those with an imagined persecution complex as it does to marginalized people who are actually persecuted. That's not a flaw in itself, but it does belie that despite whatever the audience brings into it, the film's central, strictly textual scenario is a little on the shallow side and breaks down troublingly upon introspection. To put it succinctly, yes, I am aware of the irony in saying that, The Matrix is an extremely positive narrative about the elevation and enrichment of coming into acceptance of one's own identity, but it's just as much a vengeful narrative about the joys of inflicting brutality on those who denied your identity, blowing up the world that reinforced said denial, and the freedom of doing both without having to care about the literal or figurative collateral damage of whoever happened to be in your way. Which, you know, kind of undercuts that point a little bit. As long as The Matrix exists, the human race will never be free. The very minds of the people we are trying to save. If you are not one of us, you are one of them. These people are still a part of that system, and that makes them our enemy. It is, however, not surprising that a film that is A, dialed so directly into the adolescent id of the audience, and one suspects at least in part of the creators, and B, the result of two young maverick talents getting to play with a gigantic expensive studio toy box for the first time, has this kind of issue with its narrative. Unfortunately, since as we've discussed, the Wachowskis do not do a lot of public speaking about the non-technical side of their creative process, we don't really have a clear window into what was on their mind then and whether or not it's evolved over time. However, to quote Jean-Luc Godard, in order to criticize a movie, you have to make another movie. Okay, so because this series is interested more in subtext and technical achievement than continuity or service level narrative, we don't typically talk about sequel business here on Really That Good, and also because these damn things take long enough to make as it is. But an exception needs to be made in the case of The Matrix Reloaded and The Matrix Revolutions, or at least certain aspects of them, because they both appear to be interesting and critical, deconstructive core elements of the original film that we are discussing. And while that would be interesting enough, the fact that it's a pair of sequels made as direct follow-ups by the original creators with even greater studio support and creative freedom, and 
and that so much of the most important and controversial elements present in them read all but unmistakably like a direct rebuke of their own prior creation makes this feel almost mandatory. Simply put, I would posit that while profoundly flawed and imperfect as individual films and nowhere near the achievement that the original was, a lot of what's present in Reloaded and Revolutions can very easily be interpreted as the Wachowskis taking an introspective look at the text of their own creation, and maybe also the various subcultural interpretations that spawned it, and thinking, hmm, what have we done? I feel I owe you an apology. Or at least having a second thought, sort of like how Steven Spielberg has said that now that he has a family, he probably wouldn't end Close Encounters the same way. So, even though I know that this is already quite long enough, let's add another segment and talk briefly about the sequels. Let's deal with this first. The Matrix was not intended to start a franchise or to have a sequel. That much is pretty damn clear from the way the film chooses to end. The story is about Neo discovering and accepting his true self and fully coming into his own as the One. When he does, the story is over. Plot-wise, it's made very clear that being the One means Neo can not only perceive and manipulate the building blocks or code of the Matrix, just like the agents do, he can do it better than them, hence stopping the bullets, easily defeating the most powerful among them, and graduating to flying instead of just jumping really far. That's pretty much it, right? He says he's going to free everyone from the Matrix, he stops the code to prove his point, he's no longer bound even by the laws of gravity, game over. He won. It's all over but the shouting, there's no more story to tell. Remember, this was a highly experimental movie for a studio made by two young independent upstarts who had just gotten their shot largely because they had personally impressed producer Joel Silver, who was enormously powerful at Warner Brothers at the time, and had to anticipate at least the possibility that the film might not actually work for an audience, and that they'd never get the chance to make a movie of any kind at this scale again to say, nothing of a sequel, and indeed a huge part of the film's charm is that it feels like the Wachowskis showed up to the Matrix, came to play, gave 110% of everything they had, and left every shred of it on the field. Show me. And then they had to think up some sequels, which isn't easy under the best circumstances and becomes even more difficult when you ended your first movie with the main character becoming an unbeatable, all-powerful demigod. That means you either have to invent some totally new threat to create new tension, or you have to say not so fast and rework some of your own premise retroactively. The Wachowskis opted for that second approach, and to pull it off, they built the narrative of The Matrix Reloaded and its own sequel around one of the biggest, most audacious, and certainly most divisive twists in the history of blockbuster sequels. And they almost got away with it. Hello, Neo. Who are you? I am the architect. I created the Matrix. I've been waiting for you. You have many questions, and though the process has altered your consciousness, you remain irrevocably human. Ergo, some of my answers you will understand, and some of them you will not. Concordantly, while your first question... No, don't worry. Please come back. I'm not going to make you watch the whole scene. Just this part. The Matrix is older than you know. I prefer counting from the emergence of one integral anomaly to the emergence of the next, in which case this is the sixth version. 99% of all test subjects accepted the program as long as they were given a choice, even if they were only aware of the choice at a near unconscious level. While this answer functioned, it was obviously fundamentally flawed, thus creating the otherwise contradictory systemic anomaly that if left unchecked might threaten the system itself. Ergo, those that refuse the program, while a minority, if unchecked, would constitute an escalating probability of disaster. This is about Zion. When the Matrix was first built, there was a man born inside who had the ability to change whatever he wanted, to remake the Matrix as he saw fit. It was he who freed the first of us. The function of the One is now to return to the source, allowing a temporary dissemination of the code you carry, reinserting the Prime program. After which you will be required to select from the Matrix 23 individuals, 16 female, 7 male, to rebuild Zion. Okay, that scene sucks. It's terrible. The delivery is bad, the staging is bad, the pacing doesn't work, it doesn't really arrive at the best time and place, it's the worst possible way to deliver an exposition dump, certainly one as important as this turns out to be, it's just the worst. But what makes it even more of a letdown is that in terms of what's actually being laid out here in this incredibly tedious way, the architect scene is an incredible moment. Because what's being revealed to Neo here is nothing less than that the entire moral and philosophical underpinning of the original Matrix was bullshit. 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 
Not just the prophecy of the one or the idea of a prophecy period, but also Zion, the rebellion, the entire idea of the freedom fighters liberating themselves from the Matrix by being more aware and enlightened than most other humans. It's all been a lie, engineered and orchestrated by the machines, apparently many times before this, as a failsafe for the inevitability of a certain percentage of humans to reject the simulation. Remember, Agent Smith told us in the first one that the original Matrix was a paradise in order to keep people content. Did you know that the first Matrix was designed to be a perfect human world where none suffered, where everyone would be happy. It was a disaster. No one would accept the program. Entire crops were lost. But since human brains turned out to be automatically skeptical of constant positivity, they instead built one that simulated dull, late 20th century Western metropolitan tedium. But since even amid the dull comforts of tedium, there's always going to be those who just want to rebel, the machines did what any shrewd authoritarian does with nascent rebellion. They co-opted it and set the parameters for it as one more level of control. The Oracle. She told me She I told you exactly what you needed to hear. If I am the father of the Matrix, she would undoubtedly be its mother. Plot-wise, that's devastating, because it means Neo, Morpheus, Trinity, and all the rest of them have been fighting and dying for nothing. Solid twist, at least in theory. But think about what this means for the broader revolution metaphor attached to the Matrix universe. Whether fully intentional or not, what this scene effectively represents to anyone who adopted the philosophy, fashion aesthetic, and outlook of the Matrix as part of their personal brand is a colossal, cynical finger in the eye. And it feels especially appropriate in the context of the films co-opting by young audiences of privilege as the language of their own scale shot adolescent for the hell of it rebellion. Denial is the most predictable of all human responses. If you came out of the original Matrix all charged up, hell yeah, fight the power, burn it all down, the architect is telling you, guess what asshole, your fashionable rage against society anarchy is just one more level of social control, conforming to a prefab narrative of rebellion co-opted from its original intent by the very system it was meant to resist in order to be purchased by you straight off the rack from a fucking hot topic. Gotcha, fuck you. Oh hey, or like this now infamous Pepsi commercial, another perfectly relevant thing that happened to hit after I had already written the first draft of this. Perhaps more pointedly, The Matrix Revolutions includes a key subplot about self-aware programs who want to emigrate from wherever else in the system they were originally programmed into the Matrix itself, often at great personal risk, with the heavy implication that the world simulated therein is preferable to wherever they came from, explicitly coded with post-millennial immigrant and or refugee visual signifiers who see late 1990s American city life simulation of The Matrix, you know, the place our hot topic anarchy Anarchists want to burn down because it's all plastic and phony, man, as a place they'd be grateful to live. I know that if you want to take something from our world into your world that does not belong there, you must go to the Frenchman. Is that what you're doing here? The answer is simple. I love my daughter very much. Hell, they'd probably be thrilled to have had Neo's original problem of not feeling fulfilled enough at his steady job that paid well enough for him to live with time on his hands in a thriving cosmopolitan metropolis. In a certain sense, this is the Matrix going from fight the power to oh, quit your belly ache and there's starving people who'd love to live your life. Starving people would be happy to have that. And recall again that our big finish for the entire franchise is Neo laying down his life in the name of establishing a peaceful human-machine coexistence. At the time, this was largely read and dismissed as heavy-handed plea for getting along amid the unfolding post-9-11 war on terror. But viewed in the context of the fashionable rebellion you've just adopted is just a different angle of the same social controls and you're still just a follower reveal and reloaded and the immigrant program subplot in Revolutions, I'd argue that it reads more strongly as a rebuke of the original film's ideology and the real-world philosophical parallels thereof. Just how long do you think this peace is going to last? As long as it can. See, this time, the architect actually makes it pretty clear. The truce that Neo and the machines come to, which Neo only thinks to propose after he and we have encountered the aforementioned immigrant program's perspective, keep that in mind, is essentially that if people do reject the simulation, want to be out of the Matrix, they can, and presumably, with the machines no longer trying to hunt them down and kill them, Morpheus and all the other Zion guys will stop trying to tear the simulation down. After all, if no one is being forced to live there, then what the hell business is it of the smash the system fashionable rebels to tell people they shouldn't live ordinary normie lives if that works for them. What about the others? What others? The ones that want out. Obviously, they will be freed. I have your word. What do you think I am? Human? 
Now, this is all academic, since even if the Wachowskis did intend the Matrix sequels, even in part as a deconstructive takedown of the problematic side of their original narrative, it's not executed particularly well. Reloaded and Revolutions are overstuffed, undercooked, show all the telltale signs of sequels that were largely propped up and filled out in order to draw out a franchise from something that was ideally designed to be a one-and-done. Nonetheless, if we are going to thoughtfully examine the shortcomings of the Matrix's philosophical schematic, it's at least worth noting that the filmmakers themselves may have already answered that analysis. The first Matrix I designed was quite naturally perfect. It was a work of art, flawless, sublime, a triumph equaled only by its monumental failure. At last. The Matrix. What else is there to be said? I'm, I'm asking that honestly. This was a 27-page script, so I'm kind of hoping the answer is not much, pretty well covered. Two decades later, it remains as vital, challenging, frustrating, and fascinating as it was when it first hit screens. And that's not something that can be said for a lot of films that are thought to have aged considerably better. Just as it was easy for a generation, hell, maybe even generations plural at this point, to fall in love with the way The Matrix made what may well have been a very personal and specific narrative of identity and self-realization feel like a universal expression of individual hopes, feels, and empowerment fantasies, it's equally easy to assign all of that residual affection for it to the visceral response of one's first viewing, a sensibility that was, for the most part, only strengthened by the overall disappointment of the sequels. Even for many of its most ardent fans, the temptation to dismiss memories of The Matrix as being almost entirely the product of nostalgia and the irreplaceable rush of seeing something so different for the first time. But upon revisitation, even when that revisitation involves taking a long, hard look at the more problematic aspects of its long-term pop culture presence, it is overwhelmingly clear that The Matrix absolutely holds up as an entertainment and a real piece of auteur cinema art. Very few films can lay claim to being intensely personal expressions that spoke powerfully to the feelings of marginalization and identity for a generation of moviegoers and big-scale blockbuster entertainments, and even fewer can be said to have achieved that aim successfully on both counts. The Matrix had mainstream audiences worldwide cheering for a radical redefinition of what an action movie could be, but it also sent filmgoers of many different backgrounds back out into the world asking new questions about themselves and their world, the ramifications of which I believe we still aren't equipped to fully recognize the scope of. Every few decades, the face of what defines popular cinema changes irrevocably, and almost always a matter of outsiders seizing upon a moment in time that perhaps they weren't even fully cognizant of, and delivering to the world what it didn't even know it had been asking for. Nobody saw Easy Rider coming, few were predicting that Star Wars would reshape the world, not even The Lord of the Rings was guaranteed to become as big a deal as it did, ditto the entire Marvel cycle. And The Matrix, a strange, unique object of a thing that played mainly to the cultural influences and likely deeply personal experience of its creators that wound up connecting on an unprecedented level with everyone from marginalized outsiders to those who just wanted to see things explode in a slightly different context than they had ever previously exploded was absolutely that same level of redefinition. Were the surface level philosophical needle drops more than a little pretentious and nowhere near as deep as many tried to convince themselves they were? Pretty much, yeah. Does the moralism of a lot of the underlying concept break down spectacularly upon even cursory introspection? Damn right. Have the Wachowskis explored many of the same themes in a more consistent and intellectually satisfying way in later films? I would say yes. Have they also managed to occasionally undermine their own legacy and positive standing with some very unfortunate public statements? Yeah, now that you mention it. What, was I not supposed to bring that up? In any case, The Matrix has endured, and its deeper meanings and tangible accomplishments have at this point well outweighed the less fondly recalled aspects of its enormous original presence. As thrilling as ever, and with greater dimensions doubtless yet still to be uncovered, yes, at last, The Matrix is really that good.